Hello. Today we'll talk about the Riemann Christoffel tensor, a very important object that has a lot of applications, especially in relativity. So there's a lot to be said about this topic, and I'm not quite sure what the best order is. So I'll just say things as, as they occur to me. I'll start perhaps with the most important, and then we'll see where the discussion takes us. So the Riemann Christoffel tensor is very different from the curvature tensor that we talked about in the last few lectures. Of course, they're related, but the fundamental difference is that the Riemann Christoffel tensor is quote unquote intrinsic. Intrinsic means that it can be calculated without any reference to how the surface is embedded in the ambient space. It can be calculated strictly in terms of the metric tensor and its partial derivatives with respect to the surface variables. So the reasoning goes, if you're a creature that lives on the surface and, and is not aware of the way the surface is embedded in a larger space, or if it's not embedded in any larger space at all, but that creature is capable of measure of imposing a coordinate system on its habitat and measuring distances and lengths of curves and then being able to apply the operation of differentiation to his or her calculations, then that creature will be able to calculate the Riemann Christoffel tensor, something that's absolutely not possible with a curvature tensor, because if you recall its definition, it's very much dependent on the coordinate basis, which very much comes from being embedded in a larger space, and of course on the normal, which is also an extrinsic notion. So neither one of those notions are needed to talk about the Riemann Christoffel tensor. So the Riemann Christoffel tensor is intrinsic. So this whole the discussion is intrinsic. Of course, one of the most exciting moments in this discussion, in a larger discussion, is being able to relate the Riemann Christoffel tensor to the curvature tensor. And that relationship is known as Gauss's Theorema Egregium, which is Latin for the remarkable theorem. And that's the title for the theorem that Gauss himself came up with. And it really is a very exciting relationship, especially if you understand the larger framework of extrinsic objects versus intrinsic objects. So hopefully we'll get that far today. So how does the riemann christoffel tensor arise? Well, it arises from a very natural question, which is asking whether the surface covariant derivatives commute whether they commute when applied to, let's say, a tensor or variant of order one. So applying them, so for instance, let's call the two variables S1 and S2, and then apply the covariant derivative with respect to S1, and then with respect to S2, and then doing the same thing in the opposite order, would the result be the same? So it's a question that we asked once in the Euclidean space and concluded that yes, the covariance derivatives in the ambient Euclidean space are commutative, they commute, you can in interchange them. And we gave two reasons for that. If we didn't do it in lecture, then in the book you can find two reasons for doing that, for, for why that is true. I'll remind you of what those reasons are. But generally, before you can use those elegant arguments to conclude that the derivatives commute in the ambient space, that's Euclidean, right? A simple relationship can be extracted. Because each one of these terms can be expressed in terms of partial derivatives and in terms of Christoffel symbols, and because there is another derivative following an application of Christoffel symbols, you also get partial derivatives of Christoffel symbols. So this expression can be, this term can be expressed that way this term can be expressed that way. You can subtract one from the other, let all the terms that would cancel, cancel. And of course, the partial derivatives of the operand itself cancel because partial derivatives commute. There's something very Euclidean about partial derivatives. They take space in the arithmetic space, but we don't have to think about that. We know that partial derivatives commute. So those terms cancel, a whole lot of other terms cancel, we're left with four terms. And all each one of the four terms has the operand as a multiple, which is very fortuitous because you can factor it out 
and whatever is left inside, you can give it a name. And this is called the Riemann Christoffel tensor. And it has this form, which of course I had to look up before I wrote it down. It is hard to remember. I hope I wrote it down correctly. It's quite intricate, but it's not a problem that it's intricate. It's really the properties of this expression that play the key role rather than the expression itself. In fact, I wrote down this expression for completeness, but will hardly refer to it except in one instance. Very important question. Well, why is this a tense? So we've never, I believe, we've never discussed the quotient theory. But it's a very easy theorem. It's almost an exercise in tensor calculus. And it's uh, not always elegant to state it in general terms. It's, it's more easy to apply the same kind of logic in every particular situation. And that situation is the following. So when we, the expression on the left-hand side, of course, constitutes a tensor if T gamma is a tensor. Why? Because if this is a tensor, then so is this, and so is this, by the most essential property of the covariant derivative. Now, turning our attention to this term, it's the same thing. This is a tensor, this is a tensor, this is a tensor. So everything here is a tensor. A tensor minus a tensor is a tensor. So the left-hand side is a tensor. That means the right-hand side, by virtue of equaling the left-hand side, is a tensor. So what we're looking for, what we're looking at here is a tensor. And if a tensor is broken up into a contracted product of two, of two elements, of which one is an arbitrary tensor, and the other one is this quantity where we, that we're trying to decide whether it's a tensor or not, then it is a tensor. So that was, that was very wordy, so I'll just state it one more time more concisely. If you're looking at an expression such as this, that is a tensor, for any tensor t omega, then what multiplies it is a tensor as well. So if a product is a tensor for any tensor t, and the other term in the product and contraction is also a tensor. That's why it's called the quotient theory, because you have a product of two terms, and the result is a tensor, so it's almost like dividing, in a way. That's actually very easy to show and a very important exercise to do. And as I go through my lectures in the near future, backfilling the missing parts, uh, using one argument like this, uh, using this argument to show one or two tensor properties, uh, it will be definitely something that I'll do. So you, for, for now, you can assume that that argument works, that theorem is true. So the Riemann-Christoffel tensor is in fact a tensor. So this expression, even though nothing about it looks like a tensor, is actually a tensor. So, of course, the Christoffel symbols are not tensors, that's the whole point. Their partial derivatives are even more so. Even if it had been a tensor, the partial derivative would not be a tensor. Yet, the combination is a tensor. Which, of course, uh, for us, if some important object is not a tensor, that's sort of a deal breaker right there. So obviously that doesn't occur here. Uh, this object is, is a tense. Okay, now let's remember why this very important object vanishes in Euclidean coordinates. There were two arguments that showed this. And we'll realize in a moment that neither one of those arguments are available to us anymore. Now that we're on a surface that may be curved as opposed to in a larger Euclidean space that is straight. The first argument was that since everything is a tensor, let's evaluate this expression in Cartesian coordinates. In the Euclidean space, it is possible to introduce a Cartesian coordinate system. That's almost the definition of the Euclidean space. And when you look at covariant derivatives in a Cartesian coordinate system, they're the same as partial derivatives because the Christoffel symbols vanish. Because the Christoffel symbols vanish in Cartesian coordinates, well, I already said, I already said what happens. Because Christoffel symbols vanish in Cartesian coordinates, covariant derivatives are merely partial derivatives, and partial derivatives commute. And because partial derivatives commute, this expression is zero. Therefore, the right-hand side is zero for any input t. And if the right-hand side is zero, 
for any input t, then the Riemann Christoffel tensor identically vanishes. So I've actually proven, not proven, but indicated two things. Number one, that covariant derivatives commute. And number two, equivalently, the Riemann Christoffel symbol vanishes. So that's by just appealing to partial derivatives and their commutative property. But we could have also said in Cartesian coordinates, we could have accepted this result because it's general without any assumptions. And then we could have said because Christoffel symbols vanish in Cartesian coordinates, the Riemann Christoffel symbol is zero in Cartesian coordinates, and therefore being a tensor, it is zero in all coordinate systems. You see, if the Riemann Christoffel symbol were not a tensor, we would not be able to even make that statement. Just because some variant vanishes in one coordinate system doesn't mean it vanishes in other coordinate systems. But for a tensor, because it transforms by that simple tensor rule, vanishing in one coordinate system implies that it vanishes in all coordinate systems. So, in Cartesian coordinate systems, the Christoffel symbols are zero, therefore the Riemann Christoffel uh, tensor is zero, therefore it is zero in all coordinate systems, therefore these derivatives commute in all coordinate systems. It's virtually the same argument. Another argument was to say, to not refer to Cartesian coordinates, but to recall the expression for the Christoffel symbol in terms of the basis elements, and to plug it in here. And when you plug it in here, there will be a, a basis element dot multiplying the whole thing. And so the partial derivative would be applied to it, and you will have a partial derivative of a basis element. The basis element, which you would then re-express with respect to the same basis by using the Christoffel symbols. And at that point, all the terms that you see here will cancel. And that would be, maybe, in my opinion, a better proof, because it's a proof that doesn't at least explicitly refer to a Cartesian coordinate system, which is, which is my least favorite thing to do. So that would be an alternative proof, but that proof is also not available to us. So let's, let's talk about why these two proofs are not available to us. Well, the first proof is not available to us because in a curved surface such as the sphere, there may not be a Cartesian coordinate system. A Cartesian coordinate system meaning that the metric tensor is represented by the identity matrix at all points. So you can take that as one of the definitions. Or that Christoffel symbols vanish at all points. That would be another definition, but that's more characteristic of the more general affine coordinate systems. So in the sphere, that's not possible. So right now, it may not be clear to you why is it not possible in the sphere to choose a coordinate system such that the metric tensor is represented by the identity matrix uh, at all points. So, and I agree with you, it's completely not clear. Maybe someone clever would be able to do so. But uh, Gauss's theorem at Gregium, the remarkable theorem, will actually explain why the, that is not possible. Essentially, that is not possible in any small neighborhood of any point on the sphere. Okay, but you, but you should admit that it may or may not be possible. So if it may or may not be possible, then the riemann christoffel tensor may or may not vanish. So at the very least, we don't have a proof that it does vanish based on the Cartesian coordinate system, because the Cartesian coordinate system may not exist. So that's why that argument falls apart. Why does that argument fall apart? Well, we can plug in the expression for the Christoffel symbol in terms of the basis elements that's available in any, on any surface. And then we'll have the derivative of a basis element with respect to one of the variables. But that, on a surface, may point out of the tangent space and may therefore not be representable in terms of the covariant basis again. So that argument falls apart as well. So a partial derivative of a basis element can always be represented as a linear combination of other basis elements in the ambient space, in the Euclidean space, where the derivative simply lives somewhere in the three, as a vector in the three-dimensional space, and the covariant basis is right there to decompose. But on the surface, the covariant basis only gives you the tangent plane. So if the derivative of the basis element is not in the tangent place, then it's not possible to decompose it. And it's not possible for the Christoffel symbols to reappear there again and letting these terms cancel these terms.
So that argument is also not available. So the lack of those proofs does not mean that the Riemann Christoffel symbol doesn't vanish, but at the very least we should consider that possibility that on a surface such as the sphere, the Riemann Christoffel symbol does not vanish. We can already guess that on surfaces such as cylinder or a cone, which if you take, you can take a pair of scissors, cut the cylinder and without changing any distances and wrap it into a flat sheet of paper. And you can do the same thing with a cone uh, without changing any relative distances. It's called an isometric transformation. That the riemann christoffel tensor, because the metrics and its derivatives and its second derivatives would not change from that transformation into a flat sheet. The riemann christoffel tensor won't change if each point keeps its chord. But, on a, but when it's flat, the riemann christoffel tensor vanishes because now we have a flat plane and all of those arguments are once again available to us. So if a surface can be unwrapped into a flat sheet of paper, then the riemann christoffel tensor vanishes as well. So uh, the riemann christoffel tensor, we'll find out in general, on a surface such as the sphere, will not vanish, but on some curved surfaces that are characterized by a non-zero curvature tensor, non-zero mean curvature, and all of those extrinsic characteristics, will actually still be, still have zero riemann christoffel symbol, which will imply that it has zero intrinsic curvature. All right, so that's the very basic introduction to the riemann christoffel symbol. Now I'll stop the video and restart it just to make sure I don't go over the half an hour limit that my phone allows me, four gigabyte limit. And then without erasing any of the board, I'll just continue my discussion of the riemann christoffel tensor. Okay, so here are a few of the obvious properties of the riemann christoffel tensor. They will seem obvious, but they actually lead to some of the most enjoyable and fascinating conclusions. So number one, just by looking at the left-hand side, and then also by analyzing this expression, you can easily conclude that the riemann christoffel tensor is skew-symmetric in alpha and beta. So r, whatever values here, 1, 2, equals minus r, whatever values here, 2, 1. And of course, when alpha and beta are equal, the riemann christoffel entries for those values are zero. That's obvious from the definition, but it's also obvious from its explicit expression. So let's write it out. The first obvious symmetry of the riemann christoffel tensor, r, gamma, omega, alpha, beta, equals minus r, gamma, omega, beta, alpha. All right, so that's one. Let's talk about the next one, the far less obvious one. It's actually better to lower the index. So we gave, I gave you the riemann christoffel symbol with the first index raised, which is actually the form in which it appears most often when applied to uh, in the commutator context. But when it comes to symmetries, it's easier to talk about the symmetries of the riemann christoffel symbol with the index lower. So I would lower gamma here, which would require lowering gamma here, and here, and here, and here. Okay, so I actually won't write out what it looks like, but you'll take my word for it. So let's consider it with the index lower, gamma, omega, alpha, Beta. And if you were to do this, you would realize the following surprising, excuse me, surprising symmetry. That if you take alpha and it, that if you switch alpha and gamma, and if you switch omega and beta, in other words, if you switch these two pairs of indices together, then the result would be unchanged. So it's very, it's just a formal exercise in renaming indices. So if you if you switch alpha and gamma and then beta and omega, you will see that you'll end up with the exact same thing as what you started with. Kind of interesting. So that's the second symmetry. 
That's a big R. <laughs> Alright. Alright, so here it'll say, again, it's almost dry. Here it comes. R, alpha, beta, gamma, omega. So that's a surprising, that's a surprising symmetry. Okay. And from that, you can conclude that the riemann christoffel symbol is actually skew-symmetric in these two indices, in gamma and omega, in its first two indices. How would you conclude that? Well, you would, let's see, By, when you look at R, let's see, uh, let's, gamma, omega, alpha, beta, let's see, we could switch these two indices without changing the sign, then switch gamma and omega, that would pick up the minus sign according to this skew symmetry, and then switch them back as a pair, which won't change the sign, so net net will pick up the minus sign, so it'll be net r omega gamma alpha beta. So the first two symmetries are let's say, easily observable, and this last one is a consequence of these two. It's a simple consequence of these two. So now we'll look at these, and now let's restrict our attention to two dimensions. So with the first time, and maybe for the rest of this discussion, we'll consider a two-dimensional surface in a three-dimensional space. That's as mathy as I get in my lectures. Okay. So, the thing to realize, because of these three symmetries, is that there aren't that many degrees of freedom in a riemann christoffel tensor in two dimensions. So, for example, what, what possible values are there? There could be R, well, let me just cut to the chase. There's really only one degree of freedom, and it's R1212. And it's very easy to show that any other non-zero entry can be is either this value or minus this value. For example, well, I just think it's so obvious that I'm not even sure how to explain that. Let's see. Uh, well, R2112 is minus this. R1221 is minus this value. R2121, because there are two switches, is the same as this value. If any of these two values are the same, then the value is zero. So this is really the one available degree of freedom. So there you go. <laughs> that means here come, here come some very nice tensor gymnastics. You know, I never quite realized just how just how obvious from those symmetries this statement is, that this is the only degree of freedom. That means, and now I will rename indices, because I'm no longer talking about the riemann christoffel symbol in the context of the commutator, where these names actually help you remember the function that the tensor plays, and just call my indices alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Alpha, theta, gamma, delta can be written as R, 1, 2, 1, 2, the one value, times E, alpha, beta, remember, the permutation symbol, that is 1 when alpha, beta are permutations, such as 1, 2. Well, in two dimensions, it's easier to say E of 1, 2 is 1, E of 2, 1 is negative 1, and E 1, 1 and E 2, 2 are 0. So it's just easier to list all the values. Gamma, delta. 
So that's this given that we realize the one degree of freedom that this symbol has, that this object has, this is a relatively straightforward relationship. So there's something, you can almost tell there's something here that's quite valuable. So what we have right now is, well, what's unappealing about this is that the right-hand side is not a tensor. Would it be nice to write it in such a way that everything on the right-hand side were a tensor? Well, these objects are relative tensors of weight 1 or negative 1. And uh, hmm. so now, let's convert this to a tensor form. So now I will actually stop. I will erase everything but this expression. And the next step will be replacing E's with epsilons. And when we do that, we'll have there will be a factor of two factors of square root of s, and they'll just have to go in the right place, and great things will happen, and we'll have some very nice tensors and invariants coming from that. All right, let's do that. All right, so of course I was thinking about what I was going to say, so I erased what I was going to not erase, so let's rewrite this. R alpha, beta, gamma, delta is its value, or the values of the coefficients 1, 2, 1, 2, times E alpha, beta, times E gamma, delta. And what we don't like about these expressions is the fact that these objects are not tensors. So let's replace them with epsilon alpha betas. And of course, you'll recall that epsilon alpha beta is this E alpha beta multiplied by square root of S, the area element. So when we replace this with epsilon alpha beta, we have to divide it by square root of S. And then there is another square root of S from this term. So combined, there will be two square root of S is combined, so 1 over S. So the entire expression can be written as R one two one two divided by S times epsilon alpha beta times epsilon gamma delta epsilon gamma delta. All right, and this is wonderful. This is wonderful because this is a tensor, and the entire combination is a tensor which by the same quotient theorem, even though in this case we don't have to use it, as you'll see in just 30 seconds, this quantity right here is a tensor of order zero, which means that it's an invariant. Which means that it's an invariant. And it's a very important invariant. It's an invariant that is denoted by the letter capital K. And it is called Gaussian curvature. A concept that only exists for two-dimensional surfaces. Gaussian curvature. Gaussian curvature. <laughs> this word is appropriately curved. So epsilon alpha beta, epsilon gamma delta. All right. So let's point out a few some of the important things about this invariant. Number one, it is intrinsic. It has very little to do with how the surface is embedded in the ambient space, and it's all about the distances as measured within the, within the curved surface. Okay, that's number one. Number two, it's an invariant. Number three, once the riemann christoffel symbol is computed, this Invariant can be obtained in one of two ways. This is one way, and of course, this calling it this is a little bit unattractive because it's not a very tensor thing to do to refer to a specific entry of an overall tensor. But if, as you can see, it can be very easily isolated here. Because if I were to contract both sides with epsilon alpha beta and epsilon gamma delta, and here I'll have epsilon alpha beta, epsilon alpha beta with upper indices, that's 2. 
and this would be epsilon gamma delta, epsilon gamma delta with upper indices, that's also 2. So that would be 4. So k, k equals 1 quarter r alpha beta gamma delta times epsilon alpha beta epsilon gamma delta O. Oh. And that's much more attractive because everything on the right hand side is a tensor and all the indices are contracted away indicating that the quantity, that the resulting quantity is an invariant. So this invariant is known as Gaussian curvature, and it has a lot of remarkable properties and it has a wonderful geometric interpretation that we'll talk about in the future. And what else can I say? Uh, it's also subject of uh, the very famous theorem called the gauss bonnet theorem that says that the integral of Gaussian curvature over a closed surface is independent of shape. So you can think of it as the total curvature of the quantity, excuse me, of the total curvature of the surface. It's independent of shape, and it only depends on the number of topological holes that occur in the surface. So for the sphere, the total integral is 4 pi. For a torus, the total integral is actually 0. And there, is an, and there is a very simple formula that relates the total integral of Gaussian curvature, the integral of Gaussian curvature, to the number of bagel holes that the closed surface contains. Okay, so that's, that's another property. And finally, I'd like to show you the most remarkable property uh, that's called Gauss's theorem aggregate, the remarkable theorem. And it relates Gaussian curvature to the curvature tensor. And I will actually give you an outline of that, of, an outline of the proof of that property uh, at a later date, hopefully very soon. Okay, sorry about the interruption. A phone call came in on my cell phone, which I'm using as the camera to record this. So let's talk about Gauss's theorem or Gregian. So here's the remarkable relationship that captures it. It is the fact that the riemann christoffel symbol that's intrinsic can be expressed as the following combination of the curvature tensor. Minus, and now I just have to permute the indices appropriately. Alpha delta B beta gamma. There it is. Let me <laughs> I wish I had come out a little neater, but it is what it is. So here is one of the most beautiful relationships you'll find in any subject, just based on the aesthetics of the letters and symbols. But here is the remarkable thing that it's saying. So the curvature tensor is an extrinsic object, it is very much a function of how the surface is embedded in the ambient space. It's all about the rate of change of the basis element and that the fact that that rate of change is points in the normal direction, another extrinsic characteristic. And these guys are those coefficients of proportionality, they become tensors, right? But it's all about normals and basis elements and how they curve and how the surface is embedded in the ambient space. This object is about none of those things. It's only about the distances as measured within the surface. So the surface, if you deform the surface in an arbitrary way so that 
as long as the distances along the surface don't change. Let me see. So here is a cover from the tripod that I'm using. And it's embedded in the ambient space, and it's currently characterized by the curvature tensor as well as the Riemann Christoffel tensor. And when I do this, and even this, is of course I'm changing the curvature tensor, and I'm changing mean curvature. And all the other extremes and characteristics of the surface. But because this material is strong, and the relative distances among between the points as, as you would get from one point to the other along the surface, the lengths of curves along the surface do not change their do not change as I'm doing this. That means the Riemann Christoffel tensor doesn't change. So what happens is under these transformations, the right hand side is changing wildly, wildly. All entries of the curvature tensor are probably changing in a very unpredictable and complex way. However, this particular combination remains completely unchanged. Remains completely unchanged. That's truly remarkable. And that's why it's called... So Gauss obviously thought that this was truly remarkable. And of course it is truly remarkable. So that's what makes it the remarkable theory. So what I'm going to do right now is do a little bit of algebraic manipulation on the right hand side to bring it to to find yet another beautiful analytical expression of the remarkable theory. And the conclusion will be that Gaussian curvature is simply the determinant of the curvature tensor with one of the indices raised. Of course, it couldn't be the determinant of this curvature tensor, because the curvature tensor with two lower indices, the determinant, its determinant is not a tensor, is not an invariant. It's a relative tensor of weight 2 or minus 2. So in order to arrive at an invariant quantity, of course, one of the indices would have to be raised. So let me erase the right-hand side of the board, left-hand side of the board, and we'll see how that occurs. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to come clean and admit that I'll be figuring it out as I go along because I don't remember exactly how it works. Uh, so I apologize in advance, but I only have 15 minutes to wrap the whole thing up, so hopefully it'll work out. But basically the logic goes like this. Consider any tensor, or any really two by two system, uh, and think you can almost think of it as a matrix, but let's call it A, let's not call it B, let's call it A, A. And let's consider the combination that we have over there. A alpha gamma, A beta delta, minus, a alpha delta, A beta gamma. And let's give it a name. Oh, let's not give it a name. Let's give it a name. T alpha beta gamma delta. Here's the only reason why I'm giving it a name. So, first thing you should realize I'm saving all of these for you as mini exercises. Is that this object right here is skew symmetric in alpha and beta. If you rename alpha to beta and you rename beta to alpha, you will get minus the expression that you have here. I think that's quite easy to see. Also, it's skew symmetric in gamma and delta. Once again, if you switch the names gamma and delta, on the left hand side, it will clearly change its sign. But that we could have even skipped because the other thing that we can notice is that it's symmetric with respect to this switch as pairs. So if we renamed alpha and gamma and beta and delta, the left hand side would be unchanged. So this can indeed be written 
as some unknown quantity, boy, using so many different letters now, times E alpha theta E uh, gamma delta, just like before. I wonder what the value of x is. Well, to figure out the value of x, let's just plug in uh, 1 for alpha, 2 for beta, 1 for gamma, 2 for delta. Because So then this term here is 1, this is 1, so whatever we have on the left-hand side will be x. Let's see. So like I said before, 1 for alpha, 1 for gamma, 2 for beta, 2 for delta. So what we would have on the left-hand side is A11, A22, minus A12, minus times A21. Well, that's the determinant of A. That's the determinant of A with two lower indices. That's the determinant of A. So, let me put it in here. Uh, let's see. We need just a little bit more space. Equals the determinant of A with two lower indices. Okay, that's good. And once again, I might have this <laughs> intrinsic desire to replace these non-tensor quantities with tensor quantities. So, of course, I'll replace them with epsilons, just like I did before. And if you recall, a factor of 1 over s will appear and multiply the whole thing. So let me go from left to right, just because of my poor planning, and we realize that the whole thing equals the determinant of a divided by s times epsilon alpha beta, epsilon gamma delta. That's much better, because these quantities are tensors. Now let's look at this. So that's where the raising of the index will come from. Because what S is, S, if you recall, is the determinant of the metric tensor with two lower indexes. It's the determinant of the covariant metric tensor. So 1 over S is the determinant of the contravariant metric tensor, the matrix inverse of the metric tensor. That's great. So let's write the whole thing as the determinant, going to run out of space, contravariant metric tensor times the determinant of A times the two epsilons. All right. And finally, we have to realize that we have the product of two determinants which, as we actually showed in this class before, and we're very happy to have a chance to show off the tensor technique, the technique of the tensor notation, was that the product of two determinants is the determinant of the matrix product of these two matrices. And what does this matrix product do? Well, it'll be a contraction, it'll be a contraction with a contravariant metric tensor, which will effectively raise the, one of the indices on A. So I'm a little sloppy here with which index because we're about to apply this logic to the curvature tensor. We're about to apply this logic to the curvature tensor and it's symmetric so it doesn't matter. So that's why I'm not paying so much attention. So we now know what this expression is. This expression really is the determinant of A with the index raised times epsilon alpha beta times epsilon gamma delta. So perhaps this is what Cartan referred to as the origin of indices. So you have to decide for yourself whether you like it or you hate it. And of course you should like it. Uh, not to the exclusion of the alternatives, but you should just try and embrace whatever technique you're presented with if there are some problems that it's most effective for. All right, so this was true for any general A, so let's apply it to B. 
excuse me, to this expression and on the right hand side where we have that sort of combination for the curvature tensor. So that would mean that R alpha beta gamma delta. By the way, this is true in any dimension. I'm pausing for dramatic effect, but that's important to realize. There's nothing here that's two-dimensional. I should have mentioned it before. This formula works in any dimension. Works in any dimension. What I'm about to write, because this argument was two-dimensional, this form of Gauss's remarkable theorem is only valid in two dimensions. But it looks like this. It's B with the index raised determinant off. I've actually come to denote this quantity by letter B by itself, but for now let's just make it a little bit more explicit. Times epsilon alpha theta times epsilon gamma delta. This should truly be box in its own right, even though it's only true in two dimensions. When with two-dimensional surfaces embedded in three-dimensional spaces. And if you recall, of course, the Riemann Christoffel tensor equals Gaussian curvature times this combination. So you can either go this route or you can just sort of recognize that, of course, that implies that the determinant of the curvature tensor with one index raised is Gaussian curvature. And that's probably the simplest form of Gauss's theorem of Gregorian in two dimensions. It states that Gaussian curvature equals the determinant of that form of the curvature tensor. And if you recall, for a sphere of radius r, the curvature tensor with an index raised looked like this, minus 1 over r, minus 1 over r, which of course means that the curvature tensor for the sphere of radius r is 1 over r squared, and you actually see that the total curvature of the sphere is 4 pi consistent with the great gauss bonnet theorem, which of course says that that integral does not depend on shape. But here we figured out what it is for the sphere, what it is for the sphere of radius r. So it's really a wonderful moment in this class. It's really a wonderful theorem, and it's a moment when everything comes together and our analytical power and our geometric intuition and the tensor notation is at its best, in my opinion, and our understanding of matrices and skew-symmetric tensors and skew-symmetric objects and the tensor property, which is almost invisible in all of these discussions. We almost mention it in passing, not paying so much attention to the fact that had we not been able to do that, the whole subject would completely fall apart. Everything is hinged 100% on the fact that all of the objects that you see on the board right now, with the exception of these, which we fixed as soon as we could, are tensors. And it's this tensor property that's so pivotal to this discussion flowing so easily. I think you would actually be hard-pressed to, I don't know how long this lecture has been, probably right around 50 minutes, you know, in 50 minutes, we basically went from nothing to uh, understanding the riemann christoffel tensor, understanding many of its properties, understanding its role, understanding its function, understanding its form, uh, understanding at the very least the statement of Gauss's theorem of Gregorian and its importance, and figuring out that the curvature, that Gaussian curvature is the determinant of this form of the curvature tensor, figuring it out for the sphere, and all of those things just flow, flow effortlessly from my chop. And it's all a tribute 
to this amazing framework. All right, thank you very much and see you next time.